Good evening to you all at home and here today at this uh, first event after the inauguration of the Jean-Pierre Bloomberg Chair in October uh, 2021. Tom Voss, visiting professor at the Chair Jean-Pierre Bloomberg, will hold his opening lecture today in the master class Jean-Pierre Bloomberg on short-termism in Belgian corporate governance. Tom will hereby enter into a dialogue with some outstanding guests. Sandra Robert from Huberna, Charles-Antoine Leunen from Linkleiters, and Ari van Hoe from the VBO. The audience present here today or at home will also have the chance to enter into a dialogue with uh, Tom. We are extremely proud that we can offer you today this first event of the Jean-Pierre Bloomberg Chair. And before I give the floor to Tom, I would like to wholeheartedly thank all the partners who make this possible, especially uh, the founding partners, Linklaters and the family Bloomberg. But the list of partners is, is broader and can be consulted on our website. Uh, you can also access there all information on the Jean-Pierre Bloomberg Chair. I will now pass on the floor to Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, and also from my side, a uh, warm welcome on this opening lecture on the topic of short-termism in Belgium corporate governance. And this lecture actually opens a series of workshops on this topic, all of which were, are uh, open to practitioners, students, and academics interested in the topic of corporate governance. And in my presentation today, I will give a broad overview of how different elements of corporate governance contribute to or uh, actually discourage short-termism uh, by corporations. And afterwards, uh, as Robbie already mentioned, we'll have a panel of discussants who will react to my presentation. And of course, um, there will also be, at the end, uh, room for questions uh, from the audience to, so that we can actually engage in a debate about uh, this topic. Um, the format of the other workshops of the series will be a bit different. First, because we will take a more specialized look at the different elements of corporate governance, but also secondly, because uh, the workshops will be of a more interactive nature, allowing for a debate between the students, but also the external participants on the topic of corporate governance uh, that we will discuss in each workshop. So you're also warmly invited to attend uh, those workshops. So without further ado, I want to get to the topic uh, of today, and that is short-termism in corporate governance. Um, so how can we define corporate governance? Well, corporate governance is a set of relationships between a company's management, its board, its shareholders, and its other stakeholders. So that's a broad definition of corporate governance, and, and that's, also, I, that's why I like this definition because it doesn't take an a priori whether or not, uh, for example, shareholders are the ones who are in charge of running the corporation. And what is uh, short-termism then? Well, uh, Mark Rowe from Harvard Law School defines it as follows, that financial mechanisms induce corpor corporate directors and managers to favor immediate but lower value results over the more profitable uh, long-term uh, results. And so the question is then, why do we care about uh, the problem? And we have a quote here from Joe Biden uh, before he was the president of the US, and at least he seems to think it's an important topic. He says in a Wall Street Journal article, short-termism is one of the greatest threats to America's enduring prosperity. Um, there's also a quote in the EY report on sustainable corporate governance, uh, which was offered uh, in 2020 to the European Commission, and they say, Short-term horizons that fail to capture the full extent of long-term sustainability risks and impacts could amount to overwhelming environmental, social, and economic con consequences for companies, shareholders, investors, and society at large. And the final quote, I think, is even a bit more dramatic. It says, finance world short-termism will destroy our communities, economies, and the planet. Um, I'm just going to check. Can we mute somebody? 
think that everyone is muted. Uh, is fine as now. Okay. Um, so, and the, the final quote is, the finance world's short-termism will destroy our communities, economies, and the planet. And, and that's why I sometimes tell people that my research is about saving the planet. Um, and maybe that also should have been the, to the topic of this, uh, this lecture. Um, and of course, the question is, how does corporate governance actually contribute, or how does short-termism in corporate governance could harm our economy? And to answer that question, I want to make a brief simplifying model um, of, of, of short-termism. And I'm not saying that this is the model that is true, but that is how we could think of uh, the topic in one way. And then empirical evidence has to show whether it's actually true. So let's say we have the different corporate actors. Uh, there's institutional investors and retail investors. Uh, both the clients of institutional investors and the retail investors presumably have a long-term horizon. They're saving for uh, their uh, long-term savings goal, for their pensions, for example. Um, these investors influence directors and managers, but the influence of retail investors is relatively negligible. So that's why the arrow mainly goes from institutional investors to directors and managers. And the directors and managers, their decisions affect corporate outcomes. Um, and one potential way to see short-termism is that it's caused by these institutional investors. The claim is that they have excessively short holding periods, that they are focused too much on quarterly earnings, and that they excessively discount the long-term results so that there's an, a market inefficiency. They're myopic, more than you would expect uh, a market uh, to be uh, discounting long-term returns. Uh, and under this model of short-termism, the, the directors and managers also become short-termists because the, there's several transmission mechanisms. For example, pressure by activist hedge funds uh, and uh, compensation of the managers that it's tied to the stock price. So th this causes the directors and managers to engage in short-term behavior, in, which results in less uh, long-term investments um, because these will be cut to get uh, to sh more profitable short-term results and uh, shareholder payouts are, are, are larger so the more money can be returned to, the invest, uh, to investors. And that then leads to harm to our planet. Um, so this is one way of looking at short-termism as a problem. And the, the crux of the matter here is that there's an agency problem between, on the one hand, institutional investors and asset managers, and on the other hand, uh, their, their clients and the retail investors. And the asset, so the agency problem is not with the directors, but between the shareholders. You could also have an alternative model of short-termism. You could say, well, uh, actually, the institutional investors and the retail investors are both focused on the long term, but they have few incentives to monitor the management. The retail investors basically have no in incentives and no influence. And the institutional investors, also their stakes are too low, and there are several other problems why they cannot monitor management. And here the problem is that management, out of its own incentives, has an incentive that is matched too much to the short term. For example, um, they may have, there may be managerial labor markets whereby managers want to move to uh, uh, another company and they want to prove that they are good at running the company, so they want to have good short term profits on while they're still managing the company. Another channel may be that managers uh, prefer to have short-term based stock uh, uh, short-term based compensation because it's easier for them to to make sure that they get good short-term profits and get their bonus rather than to create long-term value for shareholders. So in this model, um, it's the directors uh, who are uh, short-termist, but the result is the same: there's less long-term investment, more shareholder payouts, and uh, harm to our economy and, and planet. And so here the, 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 the problem is an agency problem between directors on the, other hand, on the one hand and shareholders on the other hand. But it's not, and at least in my view, it's not a priori clear if one of those models is better than the other or maybe that there's also no problem at all. That's also, of course, a possibility. Um, but it's, impro it's important to, to keep these different models in, 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 in mind because the policy conclusions that you would draw are, of course, quite different. If you, have, uh, if you believe that model one is true, um, then we need to encourage investors to think in the long term. For example, we can 
introduce loyalty share, we can eliminate quarterly reporting and have sustainability disclosures, all to try to make these investors think more in the long term. Alternatively, you could say we want to cut off the transmission mechanism. We want to make sure that if we have short-term investors, this doesn't affect the management by making the management not less accountable to these uh, short-term investors. For example, by discouraging shareholder activism, we can have dual-class share structures or by making the executive compensation focused on the long term. In model two, you would have actually, especially the, the, the first uh, uh, proposals, they wouldn't, um, in, in model two, you would say that's not really a problem, but it won't help much. But actually for the second type, uh, the insulation of management, uh, if you believe model two, you would actually propose the opposite uh, conclusion. You would say, no, no, we need to make management more accountable, but accountable to long-term investors. And it's hard to distinguish between which investors are acting in the short term and the long term. And that's why we need to encourage shareholder activism. We need to discourage dual class share structures that insulate management. And we need to give shareholders a say on pay, for example, so that they can monitor executive compensation. So this is broadly speaking the two models of if we have short termism, this is how it could work. And then of course the question is, um, what does the empirical evidence say about this? Which of these models, if any, is likely to be true? Um, and here's a couple of questions which I will take you through today and give you a brief uh, summary of what we know. Uh, but of course, uh, the lecture today is too short to cover everything in detail. And uh, in the workshops, we will go into much more detail on, on many of these topics. Um, let's start maybe first with uh, have shareholder payouts increased? And, and this is a classic argument for those uh, who say that there is a short-termism problem. They point to a rise in the number of shareholder payouts. So dividends and share buy buy buybacks, which are both ways to return capital to investors. And this graph comes from the EY report I already mentioned, and you can clearly see an increasing trend. It goes from uh, below 20% of net income to more than 50% of net income. And this, uh, the EY report concludes, is clear evidence of short-termism. But there's several points of criticism that can be made against this reason. Uh, for example, Fried and Wang uh, in, have uh, written a paper and they argue, well, first of all, net income is a bad uh, way to, uh, uh, to scale payouts against because actually long-term investment, such as R&D, is included in net income. So the percentage of net income doesn't give a good view of what income is available for investment because your uh, investments have already been deducted from that. And secondly, if you only look at shareholder payouts, you only have one side of the coin because there's also money coming into the corporation. Corporations are also issuing shares, raising capital, and that's also something you need to take into account. So they uh, have a different graph, and here you can see if you take into account share issuances and not only shareholder payouts, you move from the the blue line to the orange line. So that means um, that you have uh, uh, much lower actually net shareholder payouts. And in some period it was actually negative. Uh, so there was more money entering corporations than uh, it was uh, exiting, especially uh, just before the, the financial crisis. Uh, and also you have to move from the, the light gray to the dark gray area because you have to add the R&D expenses back in. And if you do those two adjustments, you see that actually uh, net shareholder payouts are, sim are only 11% of, uh, of net income, of the adjusted net income. And Fried and Wang argue that this leaves a lot of uh, income or money available for investment. Um, so that is why uh, at least this part of the evidence doesn't really show that there's a short-termism problem. It also doesn't show that there's no problem especially because it's also hard to know what is the counterfactual. What would have sh shareholder payouts been without a short-termism problem? But at least it, uh, it uh, debunks a bit the myth uh, propagated by the EY report. Um, a second uh, piece of evidence is, well, have long-term investments uh, decreased? If we have uh, too much shareholder payouts and not enough for investment, do we see that in the data? And in absolute numbers, this is simply not true in the European Union. We see that 
uh, R&D and capital expenditures have been increasing uh, on an absolute level uh, since the 90s. Uh, also, if we would scale this over revenue, you see that actually it's increasing or at least it's uh, stable since then. So it doesn't seem to be the case that uh, there's a problem of investment, but again, you could say, well, maybe these levels were too low to begin with, and without short-termism, they would have been even higher. And that's, of course, with this methodology, not something you could test. Um, third, another common argument that is uh, heard for short-termism is that holding periods of investors have decreased substantially. Uh, so this is then uh, taken as our evidence that investors are indeed increasingly short-termist focused. And this is evidence from the New York Stock Exchange, so about US corporations, but I would presume that there are similar uh, trends happening in Belgium. Um, and then the question is, is this evidence of short-termism? And Mark Rowe, uh, who uh, provided this ravenous paper, he argues, well, no, because um, we have algorithmic traders which actually increase the, uh, the decrease average holding periods of investors because they're trading faster and faster. But this actually doesn't really affect corporate governance because whether you hold shares for two minutes or one second or a nanosecond, your influence on corporate governance doesn't really change. What is important is that uh, mutual funds uh, and long-term investors in general, they, their holding periods have remained relatively constant. They haven't been declining. And actually we see that index investing has become more and more popular. And index investing, in that case, a fund actually invests in the whole index and has to hold that indefinitely. So that's, per definition, it, it seems to be a long-term investor. So it doesn't really seem to be the case that if you actually interpret the data right, that this is evidence of short-termist investors. Do note this is only evidence in the US, but I think it's likely that we have similar trends in, in Europe. Um, but is, this, is there then other evidence that investors are excessively focused on the short term? And here we do find some studies that suggest that there may be something going on. There is a tendency of capital markets in the US and UK, in UK to discount future returns, and this seems to have increased over time. There's two, pa there's two papers uh, about this. Uh, the criticism against such research is that it's always hard to have develop an asset pricing model. It's hard to say like how much should we discount future returns. The papers basically use two risk factors, uh, the, beta, the beta of a company, so how volatile its stock price is compared to the market, and uh, the leverage of the company, so how much debt it has. But it's possible that there's risk factors that these asset pricing models are missing, and it actually that uh, this explains why there's been more discounting of future returns. Another piece of evidence is that uh, public firms invest less than private firms that are matched so that they're uh, comparable with regards to specific uh, uh, variables. And that's a paper by Asker and co-authors that's widely cited. And this is believed to show, well, if Public firms, they invest less. Well, that's because there's a short-termism problem in public markets that doesn't exist for private firms who have a concentrated shareholder structure, and so no short-termism problem. But there's also recent papers that actually show, well, if we have more detailed data uh, and also a more sophisticated matching model, then we actually find opposite returns, opposite results, and public firms actually seem to respond better than private firms to investment opportunities, and uh, there's actually no evidence of a short-termism problem if we believe those studies. There's also survey evidence on short-termism. So basically, the authors of this study, they ask CFOs um, whether or not they uh, felt pressured to meet short-term earnings targets. And 80% actually said that they would decrease spending on R&D and advertising to meet a quarterly earnings target. So that's short-termist behavior. 41% said would go even further, they would reject a positive net present value project, so a value increasing project, just to meet an earnings target. So again, this seems to be evidence of short-termism, but the criticism here is how reliable is survey evidence? Uh, of course, you're asking managers who they think is to blame for short-termism, and they may have an incentive to put the blame on, on, on investors instead of 
uh, owning up for their own uh, maybe subpar long-term performance. And it's also possible that um, it's actually a perception that management has, but it doesn't translate into actions. That's a bit the criticism with uh, survey evidence. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, another really interesting paper measures uh, what happens to a corporation if there's an increase in short-term investors. And it uses a clever methodology here to establish a causal effect because it looks at uh, if a firm is included in an index, what happens to its investor base, and then measures what happens uh, to, uh, uh, to, for example, inv investments. And it finds, well, firms, if they have more short-term investors, they uh, cut long-term investments, and this increases short-term earnings, which boosts the stock price, but over the long term, this boost reverses. So this is basically exactly what the short-term uh, short miss people are saying. You have a short-term cut in investment, it boosts the stock price, but over the long term, you actually have subpar performance. Um, and then this seems to be clear evidence of short-termism, but you have to put this a bit in a context. The effect that the authors find is relatively small, and only 13% of the investors are actually short-term investors. So this doesn't necessarily show that there's an economy-wide problem of short-termism that all firms are suffering from, uh, and that this is really has a meaningful effect on the economy as a whole. But it's, invested, it's evidence that some investors may be short-term oriented and that this may have an effect on specific firms. Um, and also important to note, this is all evidence about the US, sometimes the UK, but none of the evidence focuses on European, on European countries or continental European countries and uh, Belgium. So, uh, and Belgium corporate governance is a bit particular. We have controlling shareholders. We have also several other differences and this may impact also uh, the results. And I will come back to that later. And one of the channels that uh, we have argued that is a transmission from these short-term investors which I've just described a bit of the evidence for, to directors, is through hedge fund activism, or activism in general, but hedge funds are probably the most prominent activists. Um, and here, there's also a lot of evidence on uh, what is the effect of hedge fund activism on corporations. And actually, there's a lot of evidence that finds that activism increases long-term shareholder value. For example, um, we have evidence that suggests that the stock price reacts positively uh, to the intervention of the, ha uh, of the activist. We have both US evidence and European evidence. And there's also evidence in US and in Europe that this doesn't reverse o o in the long term. So over a pe period of several years, these companies continue to perform better uh, in their stock price. The same is true for operating performance. And we also see an increase in plant productivity, investments in IT, uh, so all evidence of r relatively long-term behavior because we're doing long-term investment. There seems to be a reduction in investment in R&D, but actually the output increases, which suggests that the firms become more efficient in their R&D. And there's also fewer inefficient acquisitions. There's even evidence that simply the threat of activism for some corporations, both in the US and Europe, actually induces them to uh, uh, operate better in the long term. So taken all together, relatively strong evidence on uh, positive effect on long-term activism, even though most uh, authors argue that, well, because these activists only ho hold, their hold their shares for, on average, one year, they are, have short-term horizons. The argument here may be that, well, to exit their investments, they actually need to convince the market that they're creating long-term value. And the market, if the market can relatively assess this relatively well, actually they may have an incentive to create long-term value, despite their short holding periods. One counter argument here is that hedge fund activists seem to harm stakeholders, at least in some circumstances. We have several papers here. I won't go through all of them in detail. We have a specific workshop on that. But we have negative effects on creditors, on, on employees, on taxpayers and also on the environment. Although we also actually have an interesting, two interesting papers that find that uh, firms targeted by hedge fund activists actually decrease emissions. But still, there's some evidence that the gains for shareholders are maybe coming from other stakeholders. And you can ask the question, 
Is this good for shareholders in the really long term? Perhaps our empirical models, models are just not looking at uh, a long-term horizon that's, that's, that's long enough, because maybe if we harm stakeholders too much in the short term, um, in the long term, this may end up costing shareholders as well. So this is a bit of a, a caveat when interpreting the evidence. But um, perhaps relevant for our topic of today, for Belgian corporate governance, we actually see that uh, shareholder activism in Belgium doesn't seem to play a, mar a major role at all. Um, and on average, uh, taken over several years, Belgium has uh, per thousand listed firms, and of course we don't have a thousand listed firms, but just to make it comparable with the US, we have uh, 1.2 activist engagements compared to uh, the US 19.6 and UK 4.1. So in these countries, and especially in the US, shareholder activism actually plays a much more important role, and in Belgium, not so much, um, whether that's good or bad. And why is that the case? Well, one explanation would be, of course, shareholders may have fewer rights in Belgium. But this doesn't seem to be the case if we compare corporate law. Actually, Belgian law seems to be more shareholder friendly and not less. More likely explanation is we have a lot of controlling shareholders in Belgium, and these make shareholder activism much more difficult. Uh, a second explanation could be the, the securities law. They tend to be less uh, activist friendly in Europe. And maybe there's also a bit of a cultural difference where shareholder activists, which are traditionally uh, US investors, um, they haven't really yet adapted to uh, the, the Belgian or European culture in general. Although it also seems to be changing in the sense that more and more activists are also now targeting European firms. And perhaps it's only a matter of time before we catch up uh, with the US or the UK. But the question remains, is this good or bad, and should we encourage or discourage it? Uh, I don't want to spoil the conclusion of the specific workshops and debates we can have there, but it seems to be the case that at, at the moment there's not so much that Belgium can do. We already have relatively friendly corporate law. Um, and also, for example, or changing our securities laws or discouraging controlling shareholders, that would have other disadvantages. So perhaps the best we can do is just watchful waiting uh, on this topic. Um, another topic or another transmission mechanism uh, in the model that I showed you earlier is the compensation that is tied to the stock price. Uh, and so this is uh, important because uh, if, the, if the, the, sh the, the, the directors and managers have short-term compensation, they will also be incentivized to act in the short term. That's the theory. And um, actually here, again, there is quite some evidence that indeed, if we have equity-based compensation that, it, that is short-term oriented, this leads to short-term behavior. And several authors, they, they test this conclusion by looking at when does equity that is given to the executives as compensation, when does it vest? So when can the, the CEOs, for example, exercise their options, sell their shares? Um, and they look at what happens if the, the equity is vesting in the short term, and a paper by Edmunds, Fang, and Llewellyn, it finds that, well, in that case, CEOs tend to cut investment. Again, this leads to positive earnings in the short term, and afterwards, CEOs tend to sell their equity. So they don't, are not harmed by the long-term effects in that case. Um, the question is, of course, is that bad? Maybe that was just inefficient investments that needed to be cut anyway. But in a second paper, Edmonds, Fang, and Huang uh, look at vesting of equity again. And here they, f they look at, well, what happens if we have short-term vesting equity? And then firms uh, engage in share buybacks and M&A. And they find, again, CEOs s tend to sell their shares while they're doing this tra these transactions if they have short-term incentives. And this leads to negative long-term abnormal returns for shareholders. So shareholders suffer in the long term, but uh, CEOs, they can sell in the short term so they don't uh, suffer from it to the same extent. Um, and of course you could say, well, this vesting of equity, that's not uh, a random phenomenon. Maybe actually these statistical models don't really work. And there's an endogeneity problem, as people would say in econometrics, uh, because there's not a random shock. And in the next paper, Ladika and Seidner, they actually have a random shock. There's a rule to uh, a change to an accounting rule that forced corporations to have more, uh, to accelerate their vesting schedule. 
which means that the CEOs became more short-termist as of a sudden. And that was a nice exogenous shock, and they looked what happened to these corporations in which this was the case. And again, they find CEOs tend to cut investment, increasing short-term earnings, the stock price goes up in the short term, and afterwards they can sell their shares. So again, there's evidence of short-termism problem. And a final study also has a clever methodology. Uh, they look at shareholder proposals that, that uh, in, require the corporation to give more long-term executive compensation to the managers, and they compare the proposals that just passed with the proposals that just missed the required threshold for a majority. So these are supposed to be relatively comparable, uh, or these firms, and they find that the firms that had uh, the proposals that passed, they were actually increasing investment, which had a positive effect on the firm performance and the firm value and investment, uh, etc. So again, evidence of all of these papers have taken together relatively strong evidence that if we have short-term incentives for CEOs, this leads to short-term results. And perhaps that's not really that surprising. We have economics and economics which suggests incentives matters. If we pay people to do act in the short term, they will actually do act in the short term, even if this means that they need to manipulate, for example, a bit the short term earnings at the cost of long term uh, profits or long term value. Um, so perhaps this is uh, something that we can believe in. Um, but the open question is still, why is executive compensation perhaps focused too much on the short term in some corporations? And think again about model one. Is this that we have short-term investors who are demanding the short-term compensation, or is this for model two, that the directors themselves are, want this short-term compensation, and we have insufficient accountability uh, towards the shareholders? And that's hard to say on the basis of the evidence, although the last paper about the shareholder proposals does suggest that shareholder accountability can lead to positive results. So the policy conclusion is, um, do we need to increase shareholder rights? Perhaps this could be a good, good thing, but that's uh, hard to tell about on the basis of the evidence. But in any case, it's clear we should encourage corporations to reward executives in the long term. Okay. So what does this mean for Belgium corporate governance? Because all the papers I just discussed, they related to uh, evidence uh, on the US. And actually in, in Belgium, equity-based compensation, so stocks, uh, stock options and shares that are granted to, to, to managers, that tends to happen less. Uh, as one study finds that it's 10% of total pay compared to 42% in, in, in the US. Um, and another uh, uh, result or another finding that suggests that um, it may be less of a problem is well, we have a lot of controlling shareholders again in Belgium. And these controlling shareholders, they don't care as much perhaps about their executive compensation because their incentives are more strongly determined by their financial stake that they have in, in, the, in the company. But um, we do see that equity-based compensation is on the rise in, uh, in Belgium, and not all corporations have a controlling shareholder. So for those subset of corporations, there may still be a problem. And if we look at the Belgian corporate governance codes, it does seem to believe that we need to um, have something uh, to protect shareholders against this, or at least it thinks this is an important issue. One rule, for example, uh, says that there should be a minimum threshold of share ownership for executives. So executives should continue to hold a certain amount of shares, and this should induce them to act in the long term. But this only seems to be applied in practice by 23% of corporations. That's a finding of a study by Huberna and VBO uh, on the implementation of the corporate governance code. Um, so it doesn't seem to be a very popular provision as of yet. Another provision that is at least inspired by this long-term uh, need, or the need for long-term executive compensation is a rule that the minimum vesting period for stock options should be three years. But what's interesting to, to see is that there's actually no uh, provision that says, well, if, if uh, executives are paid in shares, how long they should hold the shares, or there's also not a provision on uh, that these shares should be held or the stock options should be held at least until the CEO or the, the manager has exited the corporation. So 
beyond their actually personal tenure. And for example, in the UK corporate governance code is precisely those two provisions that we see. We see that share grants to, to managers, they, they need to be held for five years, that's the recommendation, and there's a mandatory uh, post-exit holding requirement for uh, shares. And actually, the, the, the academic evidence, uh, for example, Alex Edmonds in his book, Grow the Pie, where we reviews executive compensation and how it can contribute to long-term investment, well, he argues the best compensation structure is precisely this. Uh, share grants that are restricted for several years, and ideally beyond the retirement or beyond the tenure of the managers. But that is something we don't really see yet in, in Belgian corporate governance. Um, although um, this, is, this is, and of course it remains more of an hypothesis, does this mean that uh, Belgium executive compensation structures encourages short-term thinking? That's still an open question because we don't really have the empirical evidence on this yet but at least it seems that it could be uh, an issue. So I've already mentioned a couple of times uh, how controlling shareholders play a role. And so far they've been largely ignored in the research because uh, the research has been focusing on US and UK where controlling shareholders are much rarer. Um, and in both models that are presented of short-termism, they play a role actually. For example, in model one, where the problem is institutional investors, the controlling shareholders can cut off uh, the transmission mechanism uh, because they actually make sure, as I've told before, activist hedge funds uh, became much more difficult to succeed and um, the compensation to the stock price matters less because the incentives of the controlling shareholder are mainly because they have a large financial stake in the company. But also in model two, um, there the problem is insufficient, shareholder, uh, insufficient accountability towards shareholders. And again, controlling shareholders could solve that. They eliminate the agency problem because they have a stronger incentive to monitor because they have a large stake. Um, so it's less likely that we have a lack of accountability of, of, of management. So in both cases, the short-term pressures seem to be uh, eliminated. Um, but the question remains, are the controlling shareholders in Belgium or in general focus more on the long term. Uh, it's an open question, I think. We do have some theoretical arguments. For example, Edmonds argues that large shareholders have stronger incentives to become informed and monitor management. Choi also argues that while controlling shareholders, they, have, uh, they can extract some private benefits from the corporation and they don't want to lose that, so they have an incentive to stay for the long term with the company and that can be beneficial. And there's also in the family ownership literature, there's several people arguing, well, family owners, which is a subset of controlling shareholders, uh, they have longer investment horizons because they want to transfer the family business to the next generation. Um, the empirical evidence on this is, uh, well, there's not so much uh, evidence on this yet. And uh, again, I think this reflects that the fact that it's often been a focus of, of US and, U and UK uh, literature, but there's one uh, study that finds that higher ownership concentration in Switzerland is associated with more innovation. And we have also actually, in this point, we have a lot of evidence on family firms. They do seem to be uh, outperforming uh, non-family firms, both in US and Europe, although it does seem to be that this effect is mainly driven by founder-led firms, so it may just reflect that we have some uh, very uh, visionary founders that uh, create more value than companies in general. Um, and it's also unclear whether it's actually because they have a more long-term uh, vision, but that's one plausible theoretical argument. Um, but there's also counter arguments that controlling shareholders may actually not be as long-term focused. For example, a controlling shareholder may have liquidity constraints uh, perhaps the family needs to fund their personal uh, style of life and they need money for that so they will ask more dividends than is actually efficient or they don't have the money to, to actually follow uh, the other shareholders uh, when the company raises capital and um, because they don't want to lose their control they avoid raising the capital and they avoid spending on investment uh, so that can cause short-term misbehavior. Or secondly, it's also possible that the controlling shareholders focus more on uh, the extraction of private benefits instead of creating long-term value. 
So again, should we encourage or discourage, discourage controlling shareholder? The evidence at this point is not very clear. And in any case, it's, it's not easy to see how we can actually encourage controlling shareholders while keeping the benefits. Uh, one way to do it, it's uh, been often discussed in literature, is by giving shareholders multiple voting rights. And uh, for example, you could say, well, we, we create two classes of share, one with uh, 10 votes per share, one with just one vote per share, and we give the, the multiple voting rights to the, to the founders, to the managers, and that's how we create a controlling shareholder, uh, even without, and the advantage is, is that you, you, you facilitate the creation of controlling shareholders because you need less financial money to, to create them, and this still reduces the short-term pressures from activist investors and executive compensation. Another advantage is that it allows the managers to keep control over the corporation, even if they're issuing more equity, because they can issue equity with low voting shares while they keep the high voting shares. But there's also disadvantage to such an approach. With this structure, with multiple voting rights, you create a wedge between the cash flow rights and the voting rights. And this means that the primary advantage of the controlling shareholder, that they have a large financial stake, which gives them good incentives to run the company, well, that decreases to some extent um, because they have uh, control, but not the proportionate number of financial incentives. And actually, the, as the wedge increases, also their incentive to extract private benefits increases and it actually becomes more risky for shareholders. Now you could say, well, that's a choice that shareholders can freely make. Uh, they have to balance um, whether they, they, they like this controlling shareholder and they believe they can indeed focus more on the long term and this outweighs the risk of private benefits. Um, but there's a risk that, that uh, that corporations will introduce multiple voting rights in the midstream while the company is already listed. And that is actually probably the most risky for shareholders, that suddenly they find themselves no longer in a company controlled by a controlling shareholder that has strong financial incentives, but by, uh, with a, in a corporation with a controlling shareholder that actually owns a very small part only in the company uh, and actually has worse incentives for the extraction of private benefits. Um, so, and there's also several things we can do to protect shareholders uh, against this. Uh, currently, in Belgium, straight multiple voting rights are not allowed for listed corporations. Same in France, but we have loyalty voting rights, and I will get back to that shortly. And the same is true for Germany. It's also prohibited, although there's a recent proposal to actually allow it in Germany. In the US, dual class share structures, or multiple voting rights, is allowed, but they precisely prohibit these midstream introductions, which I've just argued is the most risky uh, form. Uh, the UK used to not allow it for the, the premium listed corporations in the London Stock Exchange, but they've recently also adapted uh, those, their listing rules, and now it's allowed, but under strict limits, uh, recognizing the risk. And in the Netherlands and Italy, it's allowed uh, quite flexibly, actually. Um, and I've already mentioned one particular form of multiple voting rights is uh, loyalty voting rights. Mm. And loyalty voting rights are basically uh, double voting rights or multiple voting rights for the loyal shareholders. And typically, loyal shareholders are defined as any shareholder who has held his shares more than two years in a registered form. Um, that's, and that's the, typically the rule in, in France, Belgium, and, and uh, and Italy, and in the Netherlands you can also introduce it uh, under the general contractual freedom that a corporation enjoys. Uh, and here the argument is that, well, it's even more strongly linked to encouraging long-term behavior because you encourage shareholders to hold their shares for a long period of time. Now the counter argument is, it's not because you hold your shares for a long time that you're also gonna, if you have held your shares for a long time in the future, that you're gonna do the same in uh, in, the, in the future, sorry. It's not because you've held your shares for a long time in the past that you're gonna do the same in the future. So there's some criticism there. And actually the empirical evidence finds that those who are mostly using uh, loyalty voting rights are the insiders of the corporation. So the management, the con existing controlling shareholder, typically in family owned firms. And what typically happens is not that they increase their control, but rather that they keep their control steady but because they have now double voting rights, they can sell some of their shares. So reducing their financial participation. 
And of course, you can think, does this really encourage long-term behavior? Because after the transaction, you simply have a shareholder with less financial incentives to do well for the corporation. Um, but you could still say, well, uh, in effect, this, uh, you can stimulate the creation of controlling shareholders. As I've just argued, having a controlling shareholder per se is, is perhaps uh, that's value creating for the corporation. So we do see that loyalty voting rights are mainly used by controlling shareholders to enhance their control. Uh, but the question is, is that a bad thing? Because we've seen some evidence controlling shareholders may be thinking more in the long term. So I don't think it's like a definite argument against um, uh, controlling shareholders or against loyalty voting rights. But one problem that's, that is actually inherent to loyalty voting rights, or at least how it's structured currently in most countries, is that it al is allowed to int be introduced quite flexibly in the midstream. And I've just argued that the midstream introduction is precisely the most risky one um, for shareholders because they're not sure that actually it's value creating. Uh, at the IPO, you can say they invest in the company and if they don't like the loyalty voting rights or they don't like the multiple voting rights, just don't invest in it. But if you're already an investor uh, and suddenly you find yourself in a corporation with loyalty voting rights, this may harm you uh, because you can't really exit or at least not at the same price as before. And again, we do find some evidence that this is happening. In France and Italy, which have, loyalty ha had, have had loyalty voting rights for a couple of years now, we see that in, in many cases they're actually uh, introduced by a majority of the shareholders, aside from the controlling shareholder, opposed them. And how did they still manage to introduce them? Well, because the controlling shareholder was so large and because the thresholds for introducing them were lowered. Normally, in Italy, it's a three-quarters majority, but the legislator lowered the threshold to two-thirds majority and temporary for six months, even a 50% majority, which was often enough for a controlling shareholder to just pass that threshold by themselves. Um, in France, the rule was even uh, more uh, shareholder unfriendly in a way because you had to opt out of having loyalty voting rights uh, as of a sudden. So you needed a two-thirds majority not to introduce it. And with even a very small controlling shareholder, or a small reference shareholder, it was difficult to, to hold back against loyalty voting rights. We see a bit of a similar dynamic in Belgium. Also here the legislator lowered the threshold from three, three quarters to a two thirds majority. And uh, anecdotal evidence suggests that it's mainly controlling shareholders who can unilaterally push through the decision who are taking advantage of loyalty voting rights so far, although it hasn't been a, a, a systematic empirical analysis. So what does this imply for loyalty voting rights? I do believe it can be used to uh, it stimulates long-term thinking by creating controlling shareholders, but we need to have some protection against this midstream introduction. For example, we could say, if you introduce it in the midstream, you need to have a majority of the investors who are not a controlling shareholder that approve it. So the controlling, controlling shareholder, or, or any, anyone who directly benefits from double voting rights, they would be prohibited from voting on the introduction. Okay, uh, and I get towards the end of my presentation. One thing I haven't talked about yet is the role of other stakeholders uh, than shareholders. And so far we've defined short-termism as sacrificing long-term value for short-term results. But the question is of course, value for whom? And this is a debate about stakeholder capitalism versus uh, shareholder primacy whose interests should corporate governance serve. And of course, there's a link with the short-termism debate. Uh, in the short-termism theory, you would say, well, the short-termist managers, they sacrifice the long-term investments in the stakeholders in order to obtain short-term profits. And this is what Alex Edmonds has been arguing in his book. Um, if we can encourage shareholders, uh, if we can encourage corporations to, to, to uh, act in the long-term interest of st shareholders, this, uh, this can only happen if we also benefit stakeholders. So by benefiting stakeholders, we also do good for the long-term interest of shareholders, and that is the link. Um, but 
I still believe that conceptually, those are two different types of debates. Even if we succeed in the short-termism debate and removing the short-termism problem, getting corporations to act in the long-term interests of shareholders, in some cases, these interests will still diverge from those of the other stakeholders. Uh, you will have externalities, for example, um, if a corporation engages in pollution, um, the stakeholders may prefer to reduce that pollution earlier than the shareholders might want to uh, have, uh, might want to reduce that uh, pollution. So there will still be a trade-off between shareholders and stakeholders, at least in some situations. And the question is, how should corporate governance deal with that? Should corporate governance be about protecting those stakeholders as well? For example, uh, through fiduciary duties of directors towards other stakeholders and through governance rights for certain types of stakeholders? Or should this be left to regulation and taxation? For example, a carbon tax or a tax uh, that uh, tries to uh, reach more equality. Um, I don't think today's lecture is a place to settle that debate because I think it's a separate debate. But there's just two considerations here from my, my perspective on the short-termist perspective. One is that we've seen that shareholder accountability, at least in some of the models, may be necessary to, uh, or so accountability towards shareholders may be necessary to uh, induce uh, the management to act in the long term. If we start insulating the management from the shareholders to give them more freedom to act in the interests of stakeholders, this may reduce this accountability and we may end up with managerial capitalism instead of stakeholder capitalism or shareholder capitalism. So we may end up with a situation where the board acts in their own interest instead of the interest of stakeholders or shareholders. And a second point, giving some government's rights to some stakeholders may also lead to short-termism if these stakeholders are acting in a short-termist way. For example, sometimes a corporation may want to close a plant and that may be in the long-term interest of society, for example, if it's excessively polluting, but the short-term stakeholders, employees, may be harmed by decisions like that. And if we empower those, this might actually end up uh, taking a short-term perspective instead of a long-term perspective. So whether or not we need stakeholder governance is not something which I think we can answer here today. My point is simply here, it's a separate question from the short-termism debate, even though resolving the short-termism short debate and the short-termism problem with this one will actually also be beneficial for stakeholders. So to conclude, um, what have we learned today from the evidence? First, there's some economy-wide evidence that shareholder payouts and investments, uh, there's, well, that there's no short-termism problem in those areas. Although, I've, I've also mentioned, it's hard to deduce anything from that because we have no counterfactual. Secondly, both model one with the short-term investors and model two with the short-term managers and the lack of accountability, both have some empirical support. So it's hard to say, what should we do? Reduce or increase shareholder rights? There's some evidence that some investors are excessively focused on the short-term although it's unclear to say whether this is actually affecting many corporations and the economy in, in general, or whether this is just one of the disadvantages that sometimes have to be balanced with the advantages of public markets. Shareholder activism is often regarded as excessively short-term focused, but the evidence actually suggests they often create long-term shareholder value, although sometimes at the expense of stakeholders. And there's evidence that executive compensation is sometimes focused on the short term, and that this does lead to short-termism behavior. But there's some evidence that accountability to shareholders may be the solution and not the problem there. Controlling shareholders, I've also uh, argued, played an important role in, in the short-termism debate because they can reduce the transmission of short-termism and increase the accountability of management. Um, but also they come with disadvantages because they could extract more private benefits of control, especially if we have a control enhancing mechanism such as multiple voting rights. A general conclusion is that reducing shareholder rights may not always be the answer to combating short-termism and actually may be beneficial to increase them. And in any case, if we reduce shareholder rights, this also comes with a straight off. Um, 
because we actually reduce accountability of management. And finally, I think this is a point that I've made many times, we need more research on the topic of the European and uh, Belgian context in, sh in, in corporate governance and short-termism, especially the role of controlling shareholders. And unfortunately, I cannot give you a clear conclusion, does Belgian corporate governance suffer from a short-termism problem? And if so, what we should do about it? But I hope that I've offered you a conceptual framework how to think about it and some evidence on what do we know already. And what we want to do with uh, future research is answer some of the open questions that are remaining. And I hope that with the Jean-Pierre Bloomberg chair, this is actually, we will be able to answer some of those uh, questions. And I think this is a good time uh, to give the floor to uh, the discussants. And uh, I first want to invite Sandra Robert from Hiberna to give her reflections. So good evening to all of you. It's, um, I'm very glad to be in this building again. Um, I've, I've studied here. I started my career here a very long time ago, so it was a very special moment for me. So thank you, Tom, for inviting me. And thank you also for uh, highlighting this topic and giving us, Guberna, the Institute of Directors, to share also the opinion of, of these other governance actors on the topic the Belgian uh, and the European uh, directors, because through ECODA we also reflect the position of the European uh, board directors. So as did uh, Dr. Vos, I will start with the definition of corporate governance, because defining says everything, and that is how uh, Tom Vos started. So I would like to reset a bit they asked me to challenge, so I will start to challenge a bit the definitions that were given. I was especially um, rather surprised by the definition of Sir uh, Cadbury to see this definition still appear in a corporate governance class of today. So Cadbury defined governance as a structure or a mechanism to control companies. This really is a translation of the Anglo-Saxon approach that we in the Gubenna uh, classes teaches, teach as being completely outdated. Um, regarding outdated definitions, I can give you another one that was not cited by Tom, but that is, I think, very relevant in outdated definitions in this context. It's a definition of Schleifer and Vigny of 1997, which says, Corporate governance deals with the ways in which suppliers of finance to corporations assure themselves of getting a return on their investment. So, outdated, yes, indeed, and as you have seen in the, the following um, citation of Tom, the, the one by OECD, there are other definitions available today. Um, and definitions that refer not only to the relation, not only to the structure, but also to the relationships between the governance actors, and even more important, and that was missing on the slide you have seen, to the objectives of corporate governance. So corporate governance says this definition also provides a structure through which the objectives of the companies are set and the means of attaining those objectives and monitoring performance. This is very important and we find this in all the, all the uh, more actual concepts of corporate governance, such as the one that has been developed for the first time by Professor Mervyn E. King. Uh, these concepts are today much more behavior driven and also much more output oriented. So for the first time in 2016, King defined corporate governance as the exercise of ethical and effective leadership by the governing body towards the achievement, uh, the achievement of several governance outcomes. And those outcomes are not only business performance or financial performance, but more generally good performance, ethical culture, effective control and legitimacy. This, of course, reflects a much more holistic view of corporate governance. All governance actors 
including but not limited to shareholders, united or reunited around a well-defined purpose that serves as a beacon for decision-making and for the exercise and distribution of power. Of course, this much more outcome-oriented uh, definition adds a layer of complexity to the debate, which is already complex enough, I agree. And this is also reflected in the discussion that is going on about the role of companies in society today. Uh, this discussion, of course, is very much related to the topic at stake, the topic of short-termism. Um, this also alters, I think, if you think a little bit, you reflect a little bit further, this also alters the question that is um, posed today. Because profitable and long-term are not longer necessarily aligned. The question is then profitable to whom and do we take into account the damage done to others in exchange to the value created for some? Of course, this question goes beyond short term and long term and even beyond the traditional agency problems where we look at mechanisms to align interests between the internal governance actors, the shareholders, the board, the management, but not taking into account the external elements as legitimacy, externalities, also mentioned by Tom Voss. But let me take you back to the issue at stake, which is already complicated enough. This brings me to the classical agency problems that were raised by Tom Voss in his two models. Agency problems, from a business point of view, have indeed always been at the center of corporate governance, but traditionally there is a fundamental difference in the approach between the Anglo-Saxon and the continental model, which we call the Rheinland model, and this approach makes a big deal, a big deal of difference related to uh, corporate governance. Indeed, we see in the two models very um, big characteristics that are different, like the capital markets function in a different way, accounting rules are different, the shareholder structures are set up differently. And we see here that research today is indeed mainly driven by Anglo-Saxon studies and publications, unfortunately. But um, this does not set a right tone in the Belgian context. Our context, as it was also mentioned in the presentation, is a context of family-controlled um, companies. The majority of the stock market capitalization in Belgium is in families' hands, but also one of SMEs and branches, apart, of course, from the new economy companies. And this does matter. This makes a big, huge difference at two levels of corporate governance. The first one is that the impact and the role of controlling shareholders is much more important. Not only through their commitment, and this commitment is translated not only through multiple or loyalty voting rights, but also through a disproportional higher voting power due to the attendance rate at general assemblies. If we take the um, attendance quorum at general ex ex assemblies, it is much higher for the, the family uh, shareholder, which, makes, which has as a result that they weigh much more on the decision making, even uh, without uh, uh, double or multiple voting rights. But also, their commitment is showing through insider participations in the board and even in the management. So the governance of those companies is completely different from the governance principles of Anglo-Saxon structures. And so the, the, the results of these studies are to be very much nuanced in a Belgian context. But not only regarding the shareholder structure, but also from a, a culture and a policy uh, point of view, Europe is already today more much stakeholder oriented than the UK or the United States. United States. States. 
Um, we see, for instance, the two-tier structure, which makes a big uh, uh, difference in, in controlling, in creating a more distant control mechanism and allowing to, uh, to treat the agency problem in a totally different way. But also, we know in Europe, employee participation and corporate governance codes that put sustainable value creation at the heart of directors' duties. And we have in the Belgian corporate governance code the principle 2-1 that is stating that uh, sustainable value creation is the first mission of the boards of directors. So that brings me to the questions 4 and 5 of the presentation about short-term invest investment versus short-termism. We see indeed that there is evidence of a short-term focus of investors today. But the question remains whether that is the real issue at stake. So question five seems to me the most relevant. Does short-term investment really have an important effect on corporate governance in a Belgian or in a European context? Or even better, does it have an effect on these outputs of corporate governance? Because, as I remind you, corporate governance is a means and not an objective in itself. So it is the question not just about shareholders and the objective of the shareholder, but of the shareholder versus the stakeholder. Are we not in, fr in framing the question that way, starting from the premise that long-term shareholders' interest is per definition equivalent to sustainable value creation. So it goes further than only the short term versus the long term debate, but it is about aligning the interests of the shareholders and the stakeholders. I have understood that Ari Van Hu will elaborate on this further, so I'm really looking forward to it. Um, this brings me to the topic of the executive compensation, the equity-based compensation that is indeed also on the rise, also in the Belgian context. It was quoted, I think, by Tom Voss that um, compensation is important as a driver of good governance. And you know what they say about compensation. The good thing is that it drives behavior, but the bad thing is also that it drives behavior. So, in general, we see that, comp that uh, executive compensation is controversial as a corporate governance mechanism and it should be looked at in a very nuanced way. Also, uh, related to this topic, we see a very important uh, difference between the two governance models, the continental and the Anglo-Saxon models. And this difference is due to the difference between the agency problem, the agency models, as they, are, they occur in each model. The, the, the balance of power is indeed totally um, different. Nevertheless, we see in the Corporate Governance Code 2020 that the minimum threshold of shares for executives and non-executives is prescribed to induce more long-term commitment. First, related to what uh, Tom De Vos was saying, I want to mention that indeed if the comply rate of the principle 7.9 of the code 2020, so the threshold of shares for executives, is only 23%, as it was mentioned on the slides, um, the respect rate is nevertheless 92% and even 100% for the Bell 20, which means that there is a difference between complying and respecting the Code 2020. I think this is important to point out because the Code 2020 is a principle-based code. It is based on the comply or explain principle and the spirit of good governance is that there is no one size fits all and a good explain can be as worthy as a pure comply. A second element to mention related to the executive compensation is another very important tendency um, of the growing importance of the ESG metrics in, um, this, uh, in this mechanism of corporate governance. I um, want to share with you, just in numbers, I don't have slides, a recent study by Willis Towers Watson, 
um, they studied the disclosure of 327 companies all over Europe in the top indices. And this showed that in Europe, in ESG, as ESG metrics are concerned, uh, today 38% of the companies use at least one metric related to environment, 69 use one related to social, and 56 uses one related to governance. But as human capital as a whole is concerned, we see that within the big European companies, 64% of the metrics are based on human capital, which means HR, diversity and inclusion, and health and safety. Another corporate governance uh, mechanism that was tackled by Tom Voss was activism. Um, there is indeed uh, evidence that shareholder activism is coming to Europe and is also increasing, and that it is uh, increasing um, long-term shareholders' value. This is logical because activism keeps you awake. Uh, the question is being raised and you have to react, you have to, the company has to be prepared to activists' questions. Um, what we have seen here was a special uh, focus on shareholders' activism, but it goes very much broader today. Activists, pre activists present themselves as governance actors to be reckoned with, uh, be it in the general meeting, the traditional shareholder activism, but maybe with another objective today, we think of, of Exxon or Solvay, or in a courtroom, and then we think as Shell, um, of Shell as an example. In the end, for me, the conclusion is that the real question indeed is about short-term governance versus long-term governance, and not only at shareholders' level. There will, of course, always be short-term investments. It is part of human nature. And even long-term investment does not absolutely guarantee that value creation is really sustainable. And of course, we need investors and we shall always need them. The question is, how do we avoid, avoid that short-term investment or blind for other interest investment leads to short-term oriented governance. In the opinion of Huberna, we do this by a balanced set of rules, but also by a clear policy and dedicated people. At Huberna, we think that in doing so, the, the role of the board of directors is key, because free from self-interest and sufficiently committed, the board shall gather all governance actors around a shared purpose and it is this purpose that will, sh that will serve as a beacon for trade-off. So, be because, again, in governance there is no one-size-fits-all, and we think that an overly formal approach of corporate governance will not serve value creation. Thank you. I I think I will uh, react after all of the three discussions, so I will give now the floor to Charles Antoine Leunen uh, from Nick Leiters. Thank you, thank you Tom, <clears throat> and also a pleasure to be here, and thank you, thank you for the invitation. I'll, I'll be very brief, um, and, and thank you also Sandra for uh, a very helpful uh, overview of um, quite a number of topics. Um, actually Tom, you, you asked me to challenge you, and, and that's what I'm going to do on with four relatively simple uh, questions, I hope. Uh, you've passed your doctorate. Um, but um, the first point uh, is a reaction to, to one of your first slides about short-term and long-term, uh, because I think that in literature or generally in, in debates, we sometimes confuse two different elements, which is short-term versus long-term and shareholder versus stakeholder. And those two are not necessarily aligned, and I think sometimes we, we forget to draw that distinction, uh, which uh, I think is unhelpful, because it's not because uh, something is good in the short term for a shareholder that it's necessarily bad in the long term or, or vice versa. And, and again, we need to draw that distinction uh, also between shareholders and stakeholders. Those are different interests, and I think it's very important, presumably, but I'd like to hear you uh, on that point. 
to understand why, for example, uh, the long term is, is better. Is that the long term for the shareholder? Is that the long term for the uh, stakeholder? So that was a, a, a first uh, question. Um, I had a sneak preview of, of your slides a couple of days ago and, and realized how much uh, uh, literature you had um, reviewed and verified. And, and I had a question around that because, uh, of course, I didn't double check uh, on it. Um, uh, but I wanted to know how much of uh, the literature was driven, uh, and the analysis, uh, was driven by analysis on listed companies. Um, and I'd like to, to, to make the comparison with uh, privately held companies. How much can, can we say of, of some of the conclusions that you've drawn is also applicable uh, for privately held uh, companies and, and private equity in particular? Uh, because in private equity, very often we also say that the holding periods are pretty short. Uh, they uh, go about the um, duration of the fund, five to seven years. You have new asset classes that appear with the concept of patient capital, uh, which tends to take a longer term uh, view on things. And I think it's, it's also interesting to hear how much of that uh, is uh, relevant for these privately held uh, companies. My next question is around um, uh, accounting. Not my favorite topic, but um, accounting uh, seems to be um, what is sometimes driving uh, that short-termism. Uh, and there is a question whether we should not be reforming um, some of our accounting uh, principles uh, to take into account other measures, such as sustainability indicators or others. Uh, There's a very good book that has just come out, uh, written by uh, Emmanuel Faber, the former CEO of uh, Danone, who was fired uh, by uh, or following uh, some activist intervention, arguably. Um, but he's pushing really hard uh, and it's also involved in, in some efforts by accounting governing bodies to, to actually change the metrics uh, that we're looking at. Uh, and this is also an element that, that, may, be, or that may become a, a, a tense question uh, for, your, for your sessions or maybe uh, one for uh, next year, uh, for the next round of the uh, Jean-Pierre Bloomberg um, um, lecture. And then finally, final point is uh, on the concept of controlling shareholder. Um, I may have missed it, but you didn't mention uh, the concept of minority investor. Um, and uh, minority protection is, of course, also something that in corporate law we look at uh, quite, quite often. And I'm just wondering whether, and going back to my first question, we sometimes uh, should not see the minority investor as, as a bit of a stakeholder as well, in addition to that. Uh, controlling uh, a shareholder. Uh, so that is my, my final question, is to understand how uh, the position of the minority investor should be considered in connection uh, with the role of uh, the controlling shareholder when assessing uh, short-term versus um, long-term. So those are four small challenges. Not the best idea. But. First of all, thank you, Tom and Robbie, for the kind invitation to be part of this uh, interesting evening. It's a pleasure for me to be back at the University of Antwerp, and I could not think of a better occasion than the opening lecture of the Jean-Pierre Bloomberg chair. Another storm has announced for this evening, so my remarks will be brief, and a couple of points have already been raised by Sandra and Charles Antoine as well, so I will try to avoid duplications. In your introduction, you stated that you tell people how your research and teaching is about, is, is about how to save the planet. And if that baseline does not result in a lot of FAO funding, I don't know what will. To your mission statement or purpose, to use a term which, in fashion, which, which is in fashion nowadays, one could reply, why bother? In the long run, we're all dead. Keen said, and life on this planet will one day end. And I just read that President Putin has uh, recognized some people's republic, so the end may be near. So indeed, why bother? The answer is self-evident. This chair and your work, work matters because we have the moral obligation to delay the inevitable as long as possible. 
We have brilliantly identified the possible drivers for short-termism and long-termism in corporate governance. And I'm afraid I have little to add to this apart from some general remarks. In my opinion and experience, most people overvalue the short term and undervalue the long term. Should this not be the case, then everybody in this room, including myself, would be in great shape and no alcohol and cigarettes would be consumed, quote not. And I believe that the same goes for people in their professional roles. In a corporate governance context, people just play different roles. Some are asset managers, some are directors, some are shareholders, some are lawyers. Everybody has their own interest uh, to defend. And my default position in this debate is that all of them consider their own interest and more often than not their own interest in the short term. That's why we need rules or standards and I will not go into debate between uh, which are prefer preferable rules or standards. To align the interests of corporate governance players not only with each other or the interests of the company but also with the interests of society as a whole, preferably on the long term. So why should companies bother with the long term? To me, the answer is easy and straightforward. Economic activity does not take place in a vacuum, but has a direct effect on society and everybody who's part of that society. And companies, therefore, simply have the obligation towards society as a whole and not to a particular segment of their constituency. If not, their license to operate becomes questionable. And I brought this bottle of water to me, not uh, on purpose, just not because I'm thirsty, but it's an illustration of long term. Because if you look at this bottle from this beautiful Belgium company, uh, Chaufontaine, which is part of Coca-Cola, I think, it says, recycle me, I'm 100% uh, recycled. And then you have to look, it's, it's written by a lawyer because there's a small asterisk. Uh, the bottle, not the label and cap. But this is long term in action. This is doing something for society in the long term. So in this opening lecture, Tom, you have focused on the traditional corporate governance players. And now I will become a little bit more serious. And I can only encourage you to continue this research. For the, four, for the past 40 years or so, the corporate governance debate in Belgian literature has mostly been an endless repetition of the debate on corporate interest, with a lot of rhetorical opinions but little facts. And you will try to establish these facts, taking into account the Belgian com context and this will not be an easy task. This already brings me to my final and most important remark. This, this Wednesday, the European Commission will finally launch its long-awaited uh, uh, proposal on sustainable due diligence and corporate governance. This proposal will force companies and their directors to take into account environmental and human rights elements up and down the value chain. For me, and I truly believe this, this is where the real essence of the long versus short-term debate lays today, lies today. This legislation will truly face companies with essential questions regarding their activities and actions. And there, Tom, you also identify essential, essential questions such as changes to corporate governance to internalized externalities and uh, changes to director's duties. And of course, you're aware of the debate between Babchuk and Edmonds in this respect. Uh, so I, just, I would just encourage you to also follow these developments which you kind of separate from shareholder uh, activism and we have shareholder uh, capitalism and we have discussed about this in, in, in the past. But I would really encourage you to also follow these developments and integrate them in your research because it's my opinion that this is the essential question of our times, uh, of our time and uh, so, don't forget it. Um, uh, thank you all for this very valuable comments and uh, you, you've definitely challenged me as I have asked you to do and I invited you for this lecture as well. Uh, but I think that's a good thing. Uh, in academia we want to have uh, differences of opinions so that we can actually learn from them. And I think probably uh, and it's hard to distinct, like to distill uh, my replies to all three discussions at the same time. Maybe I was a bit over optimistic there. Um, but one clear trend through all of your comments I think was 
the role of, of stakeholders, something I've maybe ignored during my whole presentation until I think the final or the, uh, the second to final slide. Um, and I, I think I agree with Ari's call to action to, to, to follow these developments. And uh, I think that's exactly right. Uh, we have the sustainability due diligence uh, directive proposal coming soon. Charles Antoine mentioned also the sustainability disclosures, how relevant that is. We already have some proposals there. And I do think that those are indeed really relevant developments. And both of them we actually cover in one of the, the workshops. Uh, so the, we have one workshop on financial reporting. And that also goes a bit to the accounting point that uh, Charles Antoine making. And one part of the workshop will be focused on traditional accounting. So quarterly reporting, for example, is that something that leads to short-termism? But the second part of the workshop will be, be dedicated to exactly sustainability disclosures. Maybe not only the frequency of accounting matters, but also what do you have to report on? Uh, will this help also to... Um, make shareholders, uh, make corporations think in the long-term interest of shareholders, but also perhaps in the interest of, of stakeholders. Um, I also want to uh, come back to the, the challenge to my definition, and this is something I maybe should just take wholeheartedly uh, agree with and take to heart the, the, the comments on the definition. Uh, I, I think I still teach to the students uh, starting with Cadbury and uh, the traditional definition of corporate governance, but perhaps it's, it's time to update the definition there. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think uh, including all the elements that you mentioned, Sandra, uh, such as the, the purpose and objectives of the corporate governance is a very relevant uh, addition. Uh, also, your, your, your uh, recommendation or your reminder that one size doesn't fit all and to explain how a corporate governance code works, I think it's indeed valuable to, to have, uh, and that's also why my conclusion was not, we need mandatory regulation on long-term executive compensation, but perhaps the corporate governance code can uh, be a bit more detailed on how we uh, can uh, accomplish long-term executive compensation, but there will always be, have to be a scope to explain why you don't comply with the corporate governance code, because one size doesn't fit all. And this also uh, fits into the sustainability debate. There have been experimentations. Uh, uh, I know that some lawyers here in the audience have been advising on, on those actually to incorporate sustainability targets into uh, these, uh, uh, into executive compensation, for example. So, and we need to ha allow this kind of experimentation. And that's why it's important not to have too much mandatory regulation as well. Um, so, uh, to come back to uh, the disclosure of uh, ESG factors, will that lead to long-term uh, thinking? And I, I do think that's, uh, that is something we, we will uh, need to see whether actually it has an impact. Uh, I'm, I, I do think this, this will be, or at least I think it will have an impact for stakeholders in general in the sense that this will be useful information to know for the government, uh, for NGOs that want to keep companies accountable, whether or not it will be relevant for the short-termism debate on how to get corporations to act in the long-term interest of shareholders, that is a, a different question. I'm not sure that all of the sustainability disclosures are always gonna be material for investors, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't encourage the European Commission to go forward with, with, with this proposal because sometimes it's not only about the, the shareholders. And I think, as you've all mentioned, we need to maybe think how we can incorporate the, the discussion about stakeholders into uh, the corporate governance um, debate. So, um, Charles Antoine, you had four simple questions. I think I've answered the one about accounting. Uh, I hope also have tried to answer it. Uh, or like the, the short term versus long term and shareholder versus stakeholder, they're two separate uh, debates. Uh, and I think that's exactly right. Um, it, is the long term always better? It depends. Sometimes the long term shareholder value may actually be worse for short term stakeholders and long term stakeholders. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a tough question, and I'm still grappling with how to incorporate that in my research. Um, 
your question with regards to does the evidence only concern listed companies, I think most of the evidence that I've cited today indeed focus on listed companies, but you raise an interesting point. What is the role of private equity uh, companies, for example? And this is actually widely discussed as well. Uh, does private equity uh, lead to more value creation because it makes the corporations it takes over more efficient, or it actually is it um, also a bit like the shareholder activists? I think the arguments are very similar. Do they just increase the efficiency for shareholders while harming the stakeholders? And this is actually going to be covered uh, in, in one of the lectures uh, briefly as well. I think the one on shareholder structure, I include a bit on that. Um, but of course, there's uh, only so much to be covered. But what I do think is interesting that there's also some papers that private equity ownership of uh, oil wells or I think, uh, or gas uh, exploitation uh, plants actually led to m less uh, gas leakages. Uh, just to show that private equity firms are similar to shareholder activists, maybe not always thinking about only the short term. Um, and finally, you had a question about controlling shareholders. Um, what about the role of a minority investor in a controlled corporation? Well, I think there you have identified something that's absolutely missing from the literature. Uh, we already ha don't have as much literature uh, on controlling shareholders in relation to, compared to uh, uh, widely dispersed shareholder structures, but the role of a minority block holder in a controlling shareholder company. That's a topic that is uh, really underexplored, but it's, a, it's one to, to think about, indeed. Uh, I, um, I think you, well, your, your comments were very useful because actually um, you explained very well why the stakeholder approach is, is so important. Uh, the, the license to operate for companies and the obligation to society they have means that we cannot ignore uh, the long-term interest of, of stakeholders. So to you I would say I will definitely have to think about how to uh, include that in my research and I hope also uh, to my students to say that uh, especially in the last uh, workshop we will talk about the corporate purpose debate, what is the purpose of a co corporation and we also look at uh, some uh, alternative corporate forms. We have the, the benefit corporation, the social purpose corporation, uh, the Vernootschap met Sociaal Oogmerk in Belgium. All these corporate forums explicitly include stakeholders in their governance models. Um, and of course, this also raises a lot of questions. What, um, what is the consequence of that? One problem there is that we haven't had much experimentation with stakeholder governance except maybe employee participation. So the evidence is sometimes a bit more limited which means that the evidence-based approach that I took throughout the presentation is sometimes a bit more difficult to implement to, to the topic of stakeholder governance. Um, I think I want to um, uh, give now the floor to the audience and the possibility for them to answer any questions. I will also check if there's people in the teams. So if anyone wants to ask a question or give his own perspective both in the room or online, uh, the people online can use either the chat or they can also raise their hand and uh, unmute themselves and speak. Yeah, Bart. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Bert, for the for the question. It's a it's a really interesting one. Just to summarize, also for the people following online, I think the first question was uh, relating to the development in executive compensation that uh, both uh, the, the level of compensation and the, the structure of compensation with higher use of stock options and, and, and shares has been growing dramatically over time. I, I think that's, that's correct and, and the evidence uh, supports that. And, and of course the question is what is the, the, the effect all, on that? And there, I think there has been this, the, the executive compensation, the change over time, hasn't really been related to the growth of investment over time uh, yet. Also, I think because it's, it's hard to make sure economically, econometrically speaking, that it's actually those are related and it's not something else which is uh, related. But, um, and actually, there's the most economic authors, they argue that the level of compensation is actually not that meaningful uh, uh, the, the studies don't really find any evidence with um, how uh, whether corporations act in the long long term. Although there's sometimes a bit evidence of agency problems. For example, that if we ha introduce uh, uh, there's one study in Israel that finds that if you have a rule that requires shareholders to approve compensation paid to a controlling shareholder CEO, that actually reduces the level of compensation. Um, so there's some evidence of the agency problem there, but in general, the level of compensation is not seen as problematic uh, by the economic evidence, uh, because for shareholders, it's such a tiny percentage of the returns. What is seen as problematic by some of the economic evidence is the structure of the compensation, whether or not stock options and shares actually lead uh, to, to long-term uh, results and and there we have a lot of evidence actually that it does matter but it's not always there's a lot of discussion on what's the best way to structure and but there's some evidence that actually equity based compensation is better for firm performance but most of these studies are on the US and I think Sandra also mentioned a lot of the differences in in culture between the Anglo-Saxon and a continental approach to corporate governance and it's uh, sometimes hard to translate these findings into a uh, European context. Um, uh, but I also don't have a perfect answer to that, but we have one workshop on executive compensation and I have more time to go into depth there. Your second question is a very interesting one and that is, um, what is actually the short term, what is the long term? How many years? Um, and of course it's a bit of a, I avoided that question throughout your presentation. Um, if we look at shareholder activism, for example, the research there looks at the returns to shareholders over a period of three to five years as the long term. I think uh, somebody mentioned, I think Charles Antoine mentioned private equity, which is criticized for being too short term because they have a long an investment horizon of five to seven years. So what is considered long term for public corporations may be considered too short term in a private context. And I think this shows it's, it's hard to define, but just empirically speaking, after five years, it's very hard to make the case that you can actually find a model that is good enough to, to measure what the impact is. So from a practical perspective, uh, most empirical studies have to stop around three to five years. From a societal perspective, of course, we care about much longer uh, uh, the long term and uh, yeah. That's a bit my, my answer, but there's just empirical limits to, to what we can do. Um, are there other questions from the audience or from uh, the audience online? So we have a question from Jana, uh, which is a, maybe a personal question to me. Why did you choose uh, short-termism in corporate governance as a, as a research topic? Um, I think what, what inspired me the most directly was uh, the EY report that came out in, in 2020. And um, the EY report, and is actually one of the readings for next class because it's re and that's maybe shows how it got me started thinking. The EY report uh, was supposed to report on what is sustainable corporate governance towards the European Commission. Um, but if you read it, uh, and I've mentioned some of the graphs that, uh, and I've criticized some of them, the evidence is not always very 
very good, not very substantive. You can even actually ask the question, why did they give the task to a consultancy to, to review the academic evidence? I think this should have been an expert group from academics. Um, and this triggered me a bit to see like, well, there's a lot of rhetoric uh, about short-termism in corporate governance. The evidence is, isn't always the ones that are um, uh, not the most relevant or b badly interpreted. And actually, the report never mentions how Belgian corporate governance, Dutch corporate governance, German corporate governance differs between them. Uh, didn't spend any attention to national differences, to controlling shareholders and the role of them. Uh, it took, it just applied a bit the US literature and then did the same study in, 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 in European context, looking at shareholder payouts and level of investments and doing that pretty badly. And that got me interested, okay, there's, we should be able to do better than this. And there was actually a lot of reaction to that from practitioners and academics criticizing the academic nature of the, the EY report. And that is a bit what got me uh, more directly interested, although I had been following the debate uh, for a long time. And I think it's actually now is a very relevant time to do it. Probably that and the debate on sustainable corporate governance, stakeholder governance, and the recent initiatives of the European Commission, I think those are probably the hottest topics in, in, in corporate governance. Uh, but I like the short term debate because we have a lot of evidence already. And that's uh, something that I feel more comfortable with as a researcher um, than, uh, for example, making any claims about stakeholder governance where we're still finding our way a bit more. Are there any other questions? Thank you for your question. Uh, I think uh, just to summarize uh, that um, it was about uh, private equity and uh, how, they, uh, how uh, private equity firms take a, a stake in a, in a family-owned, uh, pri private family-owned firm. And then the question is, well, how do we optimize the voting rights, the control between these actors, and how does this relate to, to long-term uh, performance? Uh, I think it's a good question. Um, it's a bit out of the, the scope of the talk today because uh, the talk today was focused on listed corporations more. But as I mentioned in a future workshop, we will talk a bit about private equity. Um, but there is definitely some evidence on that. But again, I think the evidence is uh, probably US uh, focused. And actually, the uh, one of the other research lines of the, the jean Bierre Bloomberg chair, the one that I've postponed a bit for now, is related to that because uh, after I'm done with the short term topic, I also want to spend time with the chair on startup governance. And that's of course not entirely related, but it's a similar question. In a startup, how do you allocate control rights between the startup uh, among the founders, but also between the founders and investors? And you can apply that to private equity as well. Uh, and I do think that what is missing now is a good understanding from uh, and in how do we structure it in practice in, in, in Belgium and Europe, and how does this relate to, to, to the performance? But I, in, from the US, there is some uh, uh, evidence on, on, on that, uh, but I I'm, I'm, wouldn't be able to summarize it very well here and now. Okay, uh, so we have a question from Vincent as well. 
and I think everyone in the, the audience can also read it. If the agency problem occurs on both levels simultaneously, does this mean then that neither insulating or increasing the accountability of directors and managers are viable policy options? Um, maybe, but uh, what I wanted to, to point out with my um, two models is that like, they, were, they were taught a bit to be exclusive in the sense that either we have a problem of accountability to the, um, the, of the, the board to the directors, uh, of, the, of the board to the shareholders, or we have a problem that actually there's no accountability problem and it, the short-term is mistransmitted. Of course, you could say, well, what if you have short-term investors, but they couldn't transmit it to the managers, and, uh, but the problem is that uh, the managers themselves are also short-term so they would do, in any case, what the short-term investors do. Uh, and then the question is, yeah, probably you have to think of different uh, solutions in, in, in that case, in the sense that giving power to shareholders won't work, but also insulating uh, the board doesn't work. So if you have a combination of both, uh, it's not a hypothesis that I've thought about, but in what I'm thinking about it now, it could uh, create additional problems. Uh, um, um, what I think you should probably do in that case is focus on the first policy conclusion for model one, as I said, trying to educate your investors to be more long-term oriented. For example, the sustainability disclosures, eliminating quarterly reporting, stuff like that. Um, but in my view, uh, this doesn't seem to be a huge problem. Uh, I don't think that this is occurring in practice, that the empirical evidence bears out that we have uh, both problems at the same time. Okay. Um, is there any other questions? Are there any other questions? Yeah, so the, the, for the audience and online, the question is how do we measure short-termism on, on an empirical basis? And that's a very good question because I sometimes use it as a shorthand. But of course, if you try to measure it, you have to think about it more formally. What most studies do is they look at the, the effect on long-term investment, and that's usually considered R&D investment, or sometimes also capital expenditures. The counter-argument there is that, yeah, not all uh, long-term investments or all investments are actually good and sometimes you could invest in pet projects of the CEO that's not very long term but that's just a bit the data limitation that we work with um, and that's also relates to a bit the argument that short term is not always bad if you have investments that are very long term but they're not good for shareholders not good for stakeholders sometimes we need to cut it as well but most studies they look at um, um, uh, cuts to R&D, for example. Uh, another way to look at it is also long-term stock returns. So we have a, then we need to make a model of how the stock markets evolves over time, naturally, what does the market do? And then you have to deduct those market returns uh, from the returns that the, the company has uh, to see that does it perform better or worse than the market. But that is actually much more complicated than South because it's really hard to value what the stock price should have been um, considering the characteristics.